One of the best ways to become informed is to hear firsthand accounts from people who have or who are currently living in an industrial wind turbine facility. And to understand what protective ordinances should be in place to protect the citizens. <coughs> and that's why we're here tonight. It's important for you to know that these speakers that we have here tonight are volunteers. They've been offered lodging for their trip, but they are not being paid to speak. They've driven many hours to be here, not for money, but to prevent others from having to live their nightmare and to educate communities on what to watch for and how to counter when dealing with industrial wind companies. They are here to inform and educate, and we are very grateful for their generosity. Our first presenters come to us from Missouri. They drove, right? Drove clear from Missouri. They have chosen to share the realities of their lives. Living surrounded by an industrial wind power facility so that communities like ours can make educated decisions when it comes to industrial wind. Please welcome Carrie March and Nikaila Blessing. said we drove from Missouri about 10 hours. Um, we live in the middle of a 175 turbine which is about 400 megawatts and they're 500 feet tall. Um, it went into operations officially December of 2020 so we've been doing this over a year now. We called our presentation the reality of misinformation because frequently wind developers will say that the information we provide is lie or misleading or just we're misinformed. Well, what we're going to show you is what it's like to live misinformed. Um, I always like to give a little disclaimer uh, because frequently we're accused of being jealous that we didn't get paid for the project because we don't have leases. But my husband's family farm is actually under lease for this project. My husband is on the deed for the land. If he was to sign the lease, we would get paid. We have chose to not get paid because of what we live every day. All right, well hello everyone, I'm Carrie. Uh, my story um, is uh, I have three boys and my husband, uh, Caleb, and we live on about 350 acres. We were verbally promised uh, three turbines offered a lease, um, we turned that down. And um, right now we have one that is about 25 or 2,100 feet from our house. We have 16 within 1.6 miles. We can see roughly 80 from our home. Um, and just to explain a little bit of why we were here, uh, why we're here. Um, I think that right now, um, especially what Apex is, is telling, is that they are somehow the guardians of truth. And I want to be very clear that their guardianship is purely over the profit for their project. Um, we are here because I think there is a very human responsibility um, for those of us who have experienced this, uh, those of us who have spent time uh, researching and becoming educated. Um, I we, we need to be here so that you can see the realities. Um, the wind, you know, the wind developers are, they for one, don't live in a wind project. So when they tell you that the noise is fine, they don't know. So this is our opportunity, this is our chance to give you a tour and welcome you into our home. You are welcome to travel the 10 hours and come sit on my porch if you would like to, um, but this is as close as we can get. So first we just kind of want to give you a little timeline of what happened in our community. Um, so Skylar County is the name of the county that we live in. And the first reports of the wind project were in 2011. There were a couple of articles that circulated because there was concerns about the local bat population in the area. And that will become important later. Um, five years later, um, in March of 16, a wind developer introduced themselves to the county commissioner, said they were getting leases 
And then about three weeks later, the first lease was signed. And then, <clears throat> and then shortly after that, and then two years, not shortly, <laughs> two years later, there was a mention of a road use agreement in our commissioner meeting minutes. So for two years, there was radio silence about this project. There were no news articles. There was nothing in the paper, nothing on the TV. People were not really talking. There was nothing. And I just want to point out that while the wind developer is acquiring these leases, the utility company wanted to build a transmission line. And it was refused by five counties in the area. The locals got together. They spent over a quarter of a million dollars fighting this transmission line. And in the end, the utility had to scrap those plans, and they used another local utility, their right-of-ways, to build a, a, tra a new transmission line. So we still ended up with the transmission line, but in a different area. Some of these same people that bought that transmission line signed leases for the wind project. I don't get it. <laughs> so, in March of 18, you know, two years, this road use agreement gets mentioned. A month later, our commissioners passed it. No public meetings, no notification in the newspapers, nothing on TV, nothing. No one knew that they had even passed an agreement. Um, this, meet, this, uh, this road use agreement gave the county $85,000 for signing. That's it. There were no haul routes, no speed limits, no guidelines, no setbacks, no decommissioning, nothing. They got to come, use our roads, and do whatever they wanted. <laughs> this is a worst case scenario situation, guys. This is commissioners that did not educate themselves, and this is unfortunately a community that was blindsided. So, a year later, I find out about the project. I went out to my mailbox one day, and I have this letter, and it says that archaeological surveyors are going to be surveying for turbine locations. I'm like, what is going on? And then I'm walking back into my house, and I look up, and on the hill behind my house are archaeological surveyors. How that letter came in the mail that day, on the day that they're behind my house, I do not know. They were surveying a site 1,300 feet from my back door. Makes me sick. So immediately, I'm like, what is going on? So I go to the commissioners. I request copies of like anything that we have. And I was told that the county did not have any authority to do anything, that it was too late. Um, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I start digging. I start following people like Norman. And I find other people across Facebook. And Seneca actually helped me find the FAA coordinates for our project. And so I learned the I learned the size of the project. And I cried because there was a turbine, I, you know, 1,300 feet from my back door. Through this entire process, I'm asking the commissioners. I'm I'm trying to contact the wind developer. It's just constant, like shut doors the whole time. When I gave the FAA coordinates and map to my commissioners and showed them what I had found, the wind developer told them I was lying, that what I had was fake. What's funny is that those permits had been applied for in August of 2018. I found them in May of 19, and they submitted those same exact coordinates and maps to the leaseholders in July of 19. But I was a liar. So after I find this, these coordinates, I, I had been talking to the commissioners and they told me there was nothing they could do. And I said, well, that doesn't make sense because I had to buy a permit to build my house in the middle of a hay field. That means we have zoning. And we had had zoning since 1990. So I took our zoning to another gentleman in Missouri and found out that our zoning did not allow any kind of wind energy on agriculturally zoned land. So I present this to the commissioners and I request a moratorium. And I was told it was a liability. 
because they'd already signed a road use agreement. So frustrating. <clears throat> so then, shortly after, two leaseholders show up to the commissioner's meeting and ask to be on our zoning commission, which was not currently active because everyone conveniently forgot that we had zoning. Two leaseholders who in the end actually ended up working for the wind developer, helping to acquire leases and site the turbines. They were both put on the zoning commission immediately. <laughs> Anyone else see a pattern here? Then, a couple weeks later, or a week later, on the 10th, Carrie and I go to a meeting, and the wind developer's liaison is there, and he's there to discuss a zoning amendment. I'm like, zoning amendment? Nothing in the news, nothing in the paper, wasn't even listed on the agenda for the meeting. They decided not to pass it that day. But a week later, they did. They passed the amendment to the zoning, which allowed turbines as a permitted use on agriculturally zoned land. No public meeting, no notice in the newspaper, no news articles. And we're like, you can't do this. Like, you're breaking so many laws right now. So they decide that they had set up a, zone, a full zoning commission and they would hold a zoning meeting. So they held their first zoning meeting July 9th, 2019. Now, mind you, this is not even three months since I found out about the project. None of this would have happened if we hadn't given them heat. And the zoning commission decided to table the amendment. Okay, we'll, we'll discuss it and you know, because we presented like our side. <clears throat> Two weeks later, so with the 9th and then the 23rd, they, they passed the zoning amendment through the zoning commission. They <coughs> did not allow any public discussion at the second zoning meeting. The zoning meeting lasted two minutes. They called order. They, they read, passed the amendment, they voted, they closed the meeting. <clears throat> so then, shortly after that, they also decided that they would change our permit fees. They increased permit fees for everything else, and then decided they would charge turbines $250. <laughs> 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 per turbine. I mean, come on, guys. And then, <clears throat> so it was officially passed as a zoning change on July 25th, 2019. And the only, I don't even know if you want to call it setback, was a 1,500 foot setback from residentially zoned areas. We only have one residentially zoned area in our county. It's a tiny little village. There's like 30 people that live there. So they get turbines 50 feet from their homes. Otherwise, everything else is agriculture. The next day, the permit developer filed a formal application with the county it was all approved as one permit. So if you wanted to challenge a turbine location, you had to challenge the entire permit and not just each turbine itself. And then on July 31st, 2019, the permits were officially approved and the project was a go. Mm -hmm. So throughout all this, I spent a lot of time in the courthouse. <laughs> and this part to me is the most frustrating because repeatedly we were told everyone wants this project. So for our county, there in the end were 395 signatures for leases. So percent, we only have 4,500 people in our county. We're a very small county. Our, our largest town is about 1,100 people. Very small. So the percentage of our population that signed, 8.7%. The percentage that signed that actually live in Schuyler, because we have quite a few absentee landowners, 6.1%. These people decided our lives. This 6%. Percentage of signatures that got turbines was 28%. So what we learned is that they sign up a lot of people, and then when they build the project, they cancel a bunch of leases. So the number of people in Skyler that got, that got turbines, 76. So 19% of the, of the signatures got turbines and percentage of leaseholders with turbines living within one mile of a turbine 38 9.6 percent of those 
395 live within a mile of a turbine. Okay, so this is what life is like living under construction. All right, let's go for a little tour. So on July 31st, when those permits were approved, uh, literally that next weekend, the influx of people and utility vehicles and concrete trucks and rock trucks, everything you could possibly imagine, um, just starts infiltrating your community. Um, they talk a lot about jobs, and there was. There was hundreds of people from out of town that came to put this project together. Uh, Latner Energy was the contractor uh, that built the project. I have seen where Apex has used Blattner as well. So even though the wind developers are different, many times the construction experiences are going to be the same because you're dealing with the same contracted companies that build these projects. So this is a concrete plant, um, one of two. Um, and so this is my drive to school um, in the morning to drop the boys off. This is um, the laydown yard. Um, so this used to be a field. Um, and this just continued to expand. Um, and this is where they would uh, store, this was not where they stored turbine parts, but this is where they had all of their offices and they would keep um, some of the transmission um, infrastructure um, there. This is what they call a jump bridge. Um, I believe this one, our road was closed for about a month for them to install it. Um, it basically means that the bridge is not going to withstand the weight um, of the parts that are going to be brought in. So these are um, bridges that are basically built above your other bridges so that they can bring in the, the equipment. Um, yes, we had a number of these. This particular bridge they destroyed, taking off the bridge. So um, at the end of the project, it once again was closed for months. Yes, it was about six months uh, because they actually destroyed the steel. And at the time we were going through COVID and all of the supply chain issues. Um, so um, the disruption of your you know, daily life is, is significant. Um, this was a stoplight that they put up. Um, that's right. Um, many, many, many times we would sit at a stoplight and have a construction you know, truck come. Um, they didn't abide by the stoplight, but we were supposed to. Uh, many times they would use those to bring you know, parts across, across um, for us to wait for them. Um, this is um, a field that was actually part of the transmission line. Um, when they say that they clear just an acre for a turbine, um, it's a lie. Uh, this, this area, you can go to the next one too. Oh, within that, yes. Um, within the project, we have an additional transmission line. Um, there was the, the original Mark Twain transmission line. Um, but then we have another, it's a 345 kilovolt transmission line that comes within the project. Um, that, so the, the turbines are connected to that line, you know, and then that is connected to the main line. So many times, you know, we had a lot of leaseholders that signed up thinking they were going to get a turbine, and they got a power pole, which you do not get paid the same for a power pole that you do for a turbine. So there was some upset people. So for this project, we got 175 turbines, two transmission lines, and three new substations. Uh, this is a turbine base, obviously. This is um, loads and loads and loads and loads of concrete. Um, this is the rebar that they put in after. Um, this is, once again, this is their one acre that they're clearing. Um, the amount of destruction to the land is just astronomical. Um, and I think that, you know, their thought is that if they cover it up, you know, that those scars are gone. Um, and we still can see, you know, the difference between what was covered, you know, what was uh, dug up um, and, and what wasn't. Um, and I, I think that that, you know, that compaction and that disturbance is going to be there for years. Uh, this is a transformer that they brought in, and they got stuck blocking a road um, out in the country. They were asked, um, out of concern because of emergency vehicles not being able to get through, um, and one of the construction workers 
let us know that we were just considered collateral damage. So that sat there for about a week, um, and it just they just tore up the road. Uh, this is an image of the jump ridge. That is a truck that sprays some kind of substance that's supposed to keep um, the dust down, um, but it you know it lasts for about five minutes, um, and then you're back to driving a blacktop road with dust you know so much that you can't see through. This is one of our, uh, that used to be a dirt road that was passable. Um, we have several you know, roads that are not rocked or they're rocked very little, um, but we still use those to move our equipment, um, but that was not passable anymore. This, this one's a little bit personal because this is a family member. Um, they were told repeatedly, um, that they would keep that access road on top of a ravine um, to keep you know his land from being split in two. Um, the dozer showed up with GPS points and couldn't do anything. <coughs> they took a line straight through his field, so now it is separated into two parts. Uh, the way that they have moved the land, you have to go all the way around. So there is a hay field on one side, there's a hay field on the other, and you have to go all the way around. Um, to do that. And that's the same. This is the, the beginning of that, and the other picture is at the top. Um, so disturbance in your day. So this is just trying to get from point A to point B. Um, they are moving towel pieces, and then this um, right here is the hub um, in front of that truck. But at any given time, this is what you run into. Um, we did not have any type of road use agreement that required them to say, hey, heads up, this, you know, this road's going to be closed this morning for so many hours. Um, we're going to be bringing in parts, so we will not, you, know, you won't be able to, to access this road. It was a free-for-all. And if you were going to get anywhere in time, you left you know, 20 to 40 minutes early. Um, there is really just no regard for the lives of the people there. Um, and there's a lot of frustration. Uh, this was a crane path that I was trying to get to town, and once again, they just closed the road for several hours to bring the crane across. Which in our, you know, which in these rural communities, which means you have to go all the way back around. Um, and you know, one time that's not so bad, but when you do it for 18 months, um, and just you know, the the disruption in your daily life just becomes very very frustrating. Uh, this is a pretty good example of their disregard for the safety um, of the, the people. Um, but a lot of times they were also they were also skirting around the conditions of the road as well to not go through some of the worst. Uh, another train. And this is an example of a crane path. So at the time of when they were putting them in, we obviously had crops in. Um, so they just make themselves a path. So they, they'll just come in and mow the crops down based on their GPS coordinates they've been given by the wind developer. And they tell the farmers, or even like if the farmer has a tenant, that they will reimburse them for the crop that they've destroyed. Well, um, I have a family member that was renting land that was under lease that had a turbine put on it. Um, they uh, mowed down some very good beans at the end of 2019 um, and at the end of 2020 he had still not been reimbursed. Uh, this is a view of obviously a crane putting up. If you notice this is a road right here. Um, it is a blacktop. So we have several turbines that are about 500 feet um, from a road. So I'm not sure what the plan is when those you know, start throwing ice if they hit a vehicle. Um, if a blade throws, um, they're just, there's no plan. There wasn't any you know, thought you know, prior to that. Um, they continue, they run 24 seven when they are doing this construction. So at nighttime, you're gonna hear the beep, beep, beep. You're gonna hear the noises, you're gonna see the lights. It doesn't ever stop. It runs 100 miles per hour at all times. We had several um, instances, uh, we'll get into this with the roads next too. Um, to say that, that they just didn't care 
how they drove, who was in the way, would be an understatement. We had several rock trucks run off the road, cement trucks roll over, flip. We had a lot of the white utility vehicles roll over into culverts, one smashed into a tree. Um, I will say that the wind developers do not tell about all the business that your local body shop will get mm -hmm. from their vehicles because they smash them up like it is a derby. There was many people that were run off the roads. Um, they many times would park a vehicle in the middle of the blacktop. So we were just expected to always be on alert and watch out for them. So this next grouping of pictures is just what our roads ended up being like. Um, as you said, as we said, like we didn't have a road use agreement. So in our county, the county takes care of all gravel and dirt roads, and then the state takes care of highways and blacktops. So the road use agreement only really applied to the gravel and the dirt. And then the Missouri Department of Conservation decided to sign an agreement for $2.8 million dollars. Um, and that they would take care of all of the roads during construction. Well, there were over 100 miles of road that were affected. Um, and let me tell you, $2.8 million is not enough for what happened. So what you'll see a lot in these pictures is you have the road just completely degrading. What they ended up doing um, is they would go through and actually dig that out and then fill it with rock. So our roads were half, like they would dig this out. Well, you can see how they have a rock up at the top so eventually later they'll come back in and dig that out and fill it with rock so our roads were half gravel half blacktop half or a third whatever that is um, every single road within the project was labeled rough road 30 mile 35 mile per hour um, because this is what they looked like this is where they walked a crane across one of our blacktops a lot of our roads ended up like this um, I don't even know, what, like a gully, uh, from the weight, just the weight, because our, we didn't have road base to begin with. We already had poor road and infrastructure, and then all this heavy equipment, and just the pure volume of equipment, um, like just the sheer number of vehicles that comes with these projects, it's, I, I don't even know how to explain it to you. They would do this a lot on gravel and dirt roads. They would lay down these like wooden planks, Some of our roads just ended up like this. This is their road, guys. Yeah. This is a road near my house. They were bringing blades down this road, so they just cut the hill out. Um, they have fixed this road since, um, but I was actually just on it last week, and it's so incredibly rough. It's a very highly traveled road because it's kind of a cut through between two blacktops, but it's not worth traveling anymore. Oh, yeah. And then, so, there's our road. There, they all, all the roads look like that. Some of our roads still have a lot of water issues, especially some of our gravel. Um, when it rains, there's lots of just water standing. So, something that wind developers frequently tout is that they have all these new technologies to reduce the sound. Um, and so, they, it's kind of hard to see. I literally took this picture through a set of binoculars trying to get a decent picture. But they're like these little bristle or like teeth looking thing on the ends of the blades and they're only on the ends they're not the entire blade so the turbines went into operation december of 2020 february of 21 we had a ton of ice for the entire month it iced every single day that month so i took this picture after everything thawed so they lasted four months multiple of the blades look like this where the teeth are broken off
like to live around that? Because you can't shut it off. You have no control. And the sound is not as predictable as they like to pretend that it is. It varies so much depending on precipitation, wind speed, wind direction, humidity. We can tell you that the worst is when there's ice. Um, you don't want this. Does that sound like any of your befores? Yeah. All right, these are a couple images of just the red lights. Um, this is something that um, your individuals here in town uh, might want to consider. Um, it is something that you can see from miles upon miles. It is, um, it is, it won't let play. Well, you saw in the last image, or the last video. Um, the, the red lights are something that I have, um, what I consider some good quality curtains. Um, but they flash through my curtains. Um, and I sh I'm sure that the wind developer would say, we'll get better blinds, get better curtains. But we built a house on the hill. And my idea of my home was not to close my blinds all the time. At night, there's something flashing nonstop. That is not the idea of what I built my home for. This is examples of shadow flicker. So this is what the wind developer is saying is fine for you to experience. Usually it's about 30 hours a year. It is easy for them to map and mitigate shadow flicker. There is never a time that a non-participant should have shadow flicker on their property. There is no reason for it. This is my front porch. As you can imagine, it is like a light going on and off, on and off, on and off. Inside the house, I can't do it. I have to leave. Um, it is something that I can't just go to another room because if you're in another room, it flashes in the other room and it goes under the doors. It is something that I shouldn't have to leave my home, whether it's 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening. It is not something that I should live with. It is not something that you should live with. It is easy for them to mitigate, require them to mitigate. Concerns, um, we have only been living in the project for about a year. Um, as we'll talk about in a little bit, we actually have had them shut off at night. Um, all of last summer and the beginning of this summer, they have shut them off at night. We will explain why in a little bit. Um, so our exposure has been a little less um, than most, um, most projects. What I am experiencing in my home consistently is headaches. Now this is something that, you know, 
Is it possible for you to have a headache outside of a wind project? Absolutely. My middle son, Case, um, is experiencing them to the point where we are just about taking ibuprofen about every day. That's, it's not okay. Um, I know my children well enough to know that something has changed. Um, it very much follows uh, certain directions of the wind and the way that the turbines are turned to the house. Um, during the summer, when they were off, it was much better. Um, I wish it was in my head. Um, there is a, quite a few people that will mention, um, just by word of mouth, you know, that they're having headaches, that they're experiencing some dizziness, and there is some vertigo, there is some ear pain, um, and I think that they're really scared to say something um, because we have no complaint process. There's nobody, nobody to do anything about it. Um, we are just required to sit and suffer um, or move. So that is my son, Jax. And uh, it's tough to find your kid like that. It doesn't happen every night. But that's unfair to him. There should be protections in place in these projects so that that never happens. Right. So they like to say that wind energy is about the environment. So in our area, we have the endangered Indiana bat. Um, and we wouldn't know a lot of this information if it wasn't for the endangered bats. But uh, they like to say that our project is like a 70,000 acre project or something like that. But according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our project actually affects 113,873 acres. So, you know, earlier we were showing you all these pictures of the construction, all the, the dirt that they move. So per the utility company, their temporary um, impact in acreage is about seven and a half acres per turbine. So they move about seven and a half acres of dirt per turbine. And then they say that about one and a half acres per turbine is permanently affected, you know, with like paths and access roads. Well, as Carrie mentioned, even when they put the dirt back, the compaction is still obvious. Like it scars the land. So when they were applying for a permit with our Public Service Commission to get this project approved, um, they were told this project is one of the worst locations in Missouri for wind development from an ind endangered species perspective. They were also told that they were unaware of any other single wind project in the United States with the same number of federally endangered bat maternity colonies, which means the bats come to where we are in the summer to have their babies. And while tree bats are the hardest hit, there have not been any studies showing the impacts of wind turbines on endangered Indiana, Indiana bat maternity colonies. <clears throat> so they were given what they call an incidental take permit on May 15, 2021. Now, mind you, the project was already operating at this point. And essentially, this gives them the right to kill a certain number of bats. <clears throat> it says the purpose of, this pro of the project is to maximize production of renewable energy at the High Prairie Wind Facility in an environmentally responsible manner. <laughs> that's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service quote. So that's, that said, they agreed that they would feather the turbines at a cutting speed um, below 5 meters per second. Uh, 45 minutes before sunset to 45 minutes after sunrise, April 1st to October 31st, when the air temperature was above 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So from April 1st to October 31st last year, we, they found 179 bat carcasses. Eight of those were Indiana bats from April 1st to June 20th. What's interesting about that is that they log Indiana bat kills across the U.S. Uh, because they're endangered. So they've been logging them since 2009. So in the prior 11 years, only three Indiana bat deaths had occurred during summer maternity season. In less than three months, we killed eight. I know these numbers seem really small, but 
these are just the carcasses they find. Okay, they don't check every turbine every day. They only check the turbines twice a week. And they only check pads and access roads. So they don't even do like a, a large perimeter search around the turbines. And so in the next slide, you'll see how they account for this. Um, because they killed that number of Indiana bats in such a short time, that on June 21st of last year, they started shutting them down completely at night. And I've never loved bats so much in my life. <laughs> so from June 21st until like the first week of November, we had complete shutdown for about, well initially it was like 11 hours, and then in November it was like 16 hours a day. They could not operate. Even with the turbine shut down at night, they still killed bats. They still found bat carcasses under the turbines. A little interesting tidbit, because they always talk about birds and how they don't, it's not a big deal. But May 15th, March 15th to May 15th of last year, because that's the only records I could find, they found 52 bird carcasses underneath of the turbines. Most of them were hawks, but they did kill a bald eagle. Cut it in half. Because <clears throat> we have eagles too, which they still don't have a take permit for. That's right, whoever said that. <laughs> so, I just got this document recently. So, this is their estimations of how many bats they think they killed last year in 2021. If you look at that facility-wide estimated fatalities, um, if you add up spring, summer, and fall, potentially over 5,000 bats. If you are a farmer, or if you understand the environment at all, Bats are so important. These, these creatures are an imperative part of our ecosystem, and they save farmers billions of dollars. And our project is slaughtering them. So for, if you look, May 15th to August 14th, potentially over 4,800. What do you think these numbers would be if they wouldn't have to start shut down in June? Double, triple? And they still got to build it. So they also like to talk about the taxes. So in Missouri, how it works for us is that they do get taxed as like property. Um, and so these are our like total revenue for the entire county. So the project went online in 2020. So this year, 2021, we did see an increase of about $3.2 million in our total county tax revenue. Okay. Not seeing any results of that yet, but we'll see how it plays out. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, our taxes went up too. So 2020, our total tax levy, 6.1797. 6 this year, 6.3274. So I'm going to give you an example of my house. So the, the market value of my home per the assessor's office is the... 323935. I get taxed at a residential tax rate, so the assessed value that they base my levy off of is a 61550. So <clears throat> this year for my home, and we have 15 acres, we pay $3,921.11. So this little thing that says if turbine, so the turbines get taxed at a lesser rate. They get a 60% cut off the top. So if my house was a turbine, $2,623. I wouldn't mind that. Keep my own money, would be nice. Interesting more, just last week, we got increase in our tax levies again. So where I live, they wanted to create, we have normally um, rural volunteer fire departments, we pay dues. So normally my dues were $45 every year. Well, they decided they wanted a fire protection district because they want their piece of the pie. So next year, I will get to pay probably at least $184, if not more. Our nursing home also wanted to double their tax levy. So this, it'll be the same. So I think last year I paid 91. Let's see, let's go back. So last year I paid the, the nursing home $91. And based on you know, this year's taxes, they want 184 from me. So my total taxes, if based on 2021, would be over 
next year. Oh, they will go up over two hundred and seventy five dollars. So a clarification with, with the nursing home. The nursing home with the tax revenue over doubled their tax revenue and it was still not enough. Yeah. So when they tell you that these projects are going to save parts of your county, we still had to double a tax levy. So this money, this is where you get into these communities, wind project, and another wind project, and another wind project. It doesn't stop. You've got to figure out in your communities how to manage, how to continue. These do not save anything. Right, you have to manage the money you have. Another fun, the utility company asked for a rate increase last year because they bought two, they built two wind projects. <laughs> so in their rate increase documents, they first said, the wind investment is likewise beneficial and low cost. Two paragraphs down, they said, because of production tax credits and the benefit of additional, additional energy sales, this renewable energy generation is being added in a manner that is low cost to our customers, especially over the lifetime. And then two more paragraphs down. They filed this rate case because its prudently incurred costs to serve customers have increased since its rates were last set. Many of the reasons for this rate request are set forth below. They have like a table. To recover capital investments in our SEP and wind generation facilities. So, and also when the High Prairie project was approved, they were also given an additional line item on the bill. So they got to add a line item and now they want a rate increase. They initially asked for an increase of 12%, which would have increased their revenue 299 million. They were only given an increase of 8%, which I think was like $140 a year for those, for those people on average. The High Prairie project cost 617 million and when they were applying for it they were expecting 400 million of that to be from production tax credits and then this little tip at the bottom because of the bats the turbines were shut down 28 percent of the time so they were expecting that they lost like 9.6 million dollars because of shutdown well i think they'll make up for that with their eight percent increase So they also don't like to talk about operations and maintenance. Let me tell you, once construction starts, it never stops. There's a constant construction zone where we live because they're constantly replacing parts. These are just numerous turbines that have needed replacements. This one, there's a blade on the ground down here. This one's leaking oil. Guys, these are only like a year and a half old. Missing a turp, missing a blade. These were just done um, like December, January. Both of these needed blades. They also don't like to tell you how much equipment it takes to replace one blade or one naso. And when they do this, they rewiden their access roads and then they park all your, their equipment in your field. They don't park them on the access road because they need the access road. So they park all these trailers out in the field. Just a clarification, this, this turbine had about 14 trailers that were required to bring the crane parts in, those were not electric trucks. They were run on fossil fuels. So if we are doing this to get rid of fossil fuels, something's not right. Oh, these are, this is actually before the project even went online. These, these are parts that were bad before they even started them up. Yeah, this is another example of a recent. This one was done last week. Yeah. Yeah. Is it all made in China? Probably. The way that it's looking, yes. So this turbine is over by my house. When they built the project, this turbine did not operate. So last April, April 21, they came in, they replaced these two blades. I took this picture a month ago. They dropped these blades at the bottom of the turbine and they left them. So the farmer gets to deal with them now. We don't have any process for that. They can leave, they can leave all of their trash. We'll talk this just briefly. Um, I saw recently that there was an article uh, that was shared among your community here 
And um, the wind developer, especially when you're you know, talking about uh, safety, setbacks, things like that, um, they like to tell you that it's rare, that it's not going to happen, it's really nothing that we need to protect against. Um, I believe the article claimed that since 2014 that there had only been 40 instances. So we actually, in September of 2020, we had attended um, a meeting, which once again the wind developer had said it's rare, we don't need to protect from it, it's not a big deal. So we started to log just things that we you know, came across. Um, this is about 63 failures, blade throws, um, fires, um, just since September of 2020. So we will, and these are all linked um, to the articles, to the specifics, so we'll give all of this information to your coordinators here so that you can look up every single one of these pictures is a failure that's happened in a year and a half. So I'm not for sure what the definition of rare is, but it's not mine. This um, is actually our rural uh, fire department that we get in the mail uh, to pay our dues. Is it a different one? Than yes, a different one that, that became the district. So I happen to catch this in the bottom right hand corner. So this is basically saying, due to the dangerous nature of the newly installed wind turbines, our fire department is unable to endanger our volunteer firefighters by, respond to, by responding and actively engaging in emergencies stemming from the turbines at this time. That doesn't make me feel very safe. So there's a blade in your house, there's one to walk away. Yes. Which I do not, I do not condone endangering our firefighters. No. But I do feel like our county should have taken note ahead of time to make sure that there was a plan in place and there was enough distance so that I would never have to deal with a fire that I can't protect my home from. So this is a picture of my house. So I'm, I'm probably a good, I'm gonna say 2,000 feet away. So these are some turbines. Those turbines are a mile on the other side of my house. So you know, I'm a good mile and a quarter, maybe even farther from those turbines. Um, it's hard to see in this picture, and there, there's turbines behind me, but I have over 30 windows. This is in the west side of my house. So I'm facing east, my, you know, the back of my house faces west. I have over 30 windows that we put into our west facing because our view was beautiful. Our sunsets were beautiful. Most of our curtains stay closed now. That is so upsetting. This is another view of my house. These are the two turbines that are closest. Um, that closest one is about 3,400 feet. So when they're talking like 1,500 feet, maybe half a mile setbacks, let me tell you it's not enough. 3,400 feet and we can hear them in our house. When there's ice on the blades, it literally vibrates my home. Those turbines that are to the east, they're that way of the picture. They're a mile. Can easily hear them when I try to sit on my porch swing. But thanks to the bats, we do get our evenings now. So that itty bitty brown spot is my house. Um, I did this um, one time to just explain distances um, and what that looks like. Uh, this is east of my home. And that is my house. Um, that is also an unfinished deck. Uh, we built our home in 2017. Um, I don't know what the point in finishing it is. There is no quality of time spent outside. What distance is that tower from your house? This one is 2,100 feet. How tall are they? These are 500 feet. So you guys are looking at 600 feet. Yes, 650. So I will explain in this in that picture, topography makes the difference. That wind turbine, the land is higher up than where my house is. So the noise, I don't know if you've ever seen some of these examples of how noise travels, but noise travels in a cone downwards. So when a wind developer says, I stood under one and it sounded like the wind. 
My home is not directly under it. My home is 2,100 feet at the bottom of that cone. All right, well, we are, we will conclude. I think that I would um, ask all of you, um, what is your quality of life worth? Should it be for sale? Should it be? Do you want to live like this? If this goes.